All right, but what is happening with the climate change? Is COP, is it 27 or COP 29? COP, it's the Climate Change Conference. It is where, COP 27, I'm sorry, COP 27. It's where all the grifters on the global climate change conspiracy, they all come together to one place for two whole weeks. Uh, Greta Thunberg tells them they're all terrible. And they talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and fly around and pass resolutions and basically say to the developed world or efficient farmers, oh, we don't like you, Um, we're going to overthrow the world's economic system and the world is burning and the seas are rising. Problem that COP27 has got, to my mind, and of course we're represented there by someone, the problem that we've got is that, uh, and we highlighted this on the programme last week, Um, Over the last 20 years, sea level rise around the major centres in New Zealand has been in, well, the millimetre. I was going to say the millimetres. It's the millimetre. The millimetre. We are not sinking beneath the sea. The world is not on fire. More people are not dying from natural disasters. More people affected because there are more people living in places where natural disasters occur. But most of the computer modelling that has a small minority of school children clutching their pearls and taking days off school to say, oh, oh, the planet's burning. None of it is really coming true is the problem for all the climate change stuff. But here in New Zealand, like the rest of the world, we're all whipping ourselves over our backs with um, w- w- with birch leaves or, or birch sticks saying, bad us, bad us, uh, carbon bad, carbon bad, farming bad, meat bad. Um, So we're going to be subjected, I would imagine, in our news media to two weeks, two weeks of woke climate change uh, coverage and there'll be dire, there already are dire predictions. I think Antonio Guterres says we're reaching a tipping point. Time is running out. And we've been hearing that for 20 years or more. The end of the world is nigh. And one group that's really going to cop it from COP27 are our farmers. And they already are copping it by being, basically, being told your cow's farting is killing people in India. Uh, I don't know, that's like the logic. So I thought we'd go to the country's, I guess, top farmer. He's not their top farmer, but he's heads the biggest farming organisation in the country. He's been on the programme before, Andrew Hoggard, to see what he makes and from the farm gate in New Zealand, what he makes of a conference like COP27. Andrew, welcome to the program. Good morning. All right. Um, well, all the climate change experts and Al Gore and the international diplomats are, are at uh, Sharm El Sheikh, which, strangely enough, I've been to in Egypt. It's pretty boring, lots of sand and some sea. Um, yeah, I drove past that. I wasn't too excited. Not a lot of dairy cows around Sharm El Sheikh, mate, I can tell you that. <laughs> no. Rather no. bereft of any anything that looks like... Um, horticulture or agriculture. Yeah. How do you feel as a farmer city in New Zealand? How does a New Zealand farmer feel? Because you know, Andrew, for the next two weeks, there are going to be screaming headlines out of COP27 about carbon and climate change and how it's not just the fossil fuels' fault, it's you and your farty livestock. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm kind of used to uh, that sort of rhetoric now. Um I often find a lot of these, when you dig into these reports, um, they actually what they're said in, inside of them is actually quite useful. Mm. It's just the headlines get quite hysterical and people only read the headlines. So, you know, at the past events and documents that have been done by this group, they talk about, you know, the need for a 30% reduction in methane. But then when you dig into it, that, that that's not saying I've got to reduce my cows by 30%. It's saying there's a whole bunch of leaky oil wells around the world um, that we could quite easily cap and um, stop them spewing out a whole truck a truckload of methane. Um, and so, you know, I mean, if I had my wish, um, the, you know, and when the conference deals with agriculture it would be like okay recognizing back in 2015 they talked about the need for maintaining food production while reducing emissions Mm. okay how are we going to put that into practice what how do we maintain food production what are the targets for food production alone you know get they're lumping us in with all this other stuff you do not work in a communist state where government set the production goals and you know the five-year 
plan like the Soviet Union did. You react to markets. That's the most efficient <laughs> well, the, way for you to operate. Well, uh, I'd say the emissions pricing plan uh, seems to be going very much towards the pop euro model, but um, you'll wait and see if that comes to pass. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I mean, that's what I found as well. Um, so many of these sort of conferences and stuff, everyone's talking about let's control this and let's organise that and blah, blah, blah. And it's actually like the market's pretty useful. If you just put the right signals there, the the market will usually come up with a solution. Yeah. I guess, too, it looks to me from the outside like a make-work scheme for, for pen pushers and shiny, shiny bumps. Uh, yeah, you could say that. I mean... I know back in 2000, there's a reasonable agricultural presence there, and um, I mean, Katie Mill, my predecessor, she's flying her way over there now, or has already landed uh, as part of the World Farmers Organization, and so, you know, hopefully Jeez, they we can... would love to talk to her, Andrew, if you got some contacts, by the way, I didn't realise well, Katie was there. Yeah, I can we'll flick do that it, after uh, the show. Yeah, yeah, um, and you know, in past events, they've managed to get that recognition of food production in there, and so you know, I, I hope they can. Um, you know, it's going to be a hard ask to break through the echo chamber that exists at a lot of these things around. You know, yeah, meat bad and yeah. animals bad, and um, let's all eat tofu. Um, yeah. But. You know, we've got a lot of research on our side to show that actually if we want to feed the world, uh, you kind of do need uh, efficient animal agriculture alongside um, the plant-based agriculture, and the, yeah. the two are quite dependent on each other. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, in general or in broader terms, um, we have seen in the last few years a rise in, and I'm not yet going to use the word militancy, but a rise in, particularly in the farming communities, of groups that represent, if you like, a blowback or a resistance to trends like this on climate change. You know, daring is bad, the vegan push. We've got outfits like Groundswell, and I, I get the feeling amongst uh, rural provincial communities a willingness to defend a way of life or, or a position. And I'm wondering, when you look at things like the latest political poll, which shows quite a, quite a rapid, um, you know, withdrawal of the tide for Labor, do you think resistance to the anti-farming um, climate is starting to grow and build and being reflected more widely in New Zealand? Yeah, I think so. We did... Um ourselves some polling um, using a research firm a couple of weeks back on you know what were people's thoughts so the general public's thoughts on you know the submissions pricing plan and you know it was 57 to 60 percent of people um, thought that it was a silly idea uh, were opposed to it uh, only 25 percent were fully in behind the government plans and the rest were unsure and so I do think um, you know, there's more and more people sort of realising that actually, um, you know, food doesn't just magically appear in a supermarket. It's actually got to be produced out there in the land um, and people are doing a hard yakka to get it there. And, you know, uh, <laughs> they're trying their best and I think we're building up some public support. It, it had been eroded, I dare say, but I think... You know, as long as we keep showing, hey, we're actually doing a damn good job here. We're doing all we can. We're trying to solve some of these long-burning issues. Um, I think people respect that, and to me, that's what those sort of poll numbers showed. Yeah. Andrew, I guess, too, then, as you look at the political landscape, perhaps reacting in part to the issues that are facing our farming communities and our provincial communities, Um do you get the feeling really from the National Party that they're going to change anything? Because they seem to me to be quite happy to go along with the woke stuff if they think that's going to keep them sweet with the swinging voter. Uh, well, they certainly came out reasonably strong on the emissions pricing plan, and I know in talks with them they feel there's just far too much stuff being thrown at farmers now. 
Um, <laughs> of course, that, that's very easy to say this side of an election. Um, seeing, seeing what happens on the other side of elections is another matter. I guess where I'd, I'd like to see them is put some hard and fast you know, promises out there, whatever promises are worth for politicians, um, in terms of you know a solid review of these methane targets because end of the day, um, I think we've got some targets that are just plucked, like I mentioned before, that report that said 30%. That's sort of where they've come up with them from. And yep. the actual body of the report's talking about oil and gas and um, landfill, etc. and agriculture only makes up a small percentage. Yeah. And so, you know, I want National to basically, you know, say that, hey, w- place for agriculture that are scientifically based on what agriculture itself needs to do to add no additional warming and um you know let farmers get on with it yeah yeah um are you prepared for all the headlines coming at you andrew out of cop 27 that the world is ending i mean do you think we are do you think the word is ending is wellington going to end up under the water is the world going to burn to a crisp i think everyone's tuning out to that stuff to be honest and you know, and then it sort of leads them to make even more hysterical headlines, which tune people out even more. Um, you know, I, to be honest, the sort of stuff, all the, yeah, the hysterics, I just ignore these days. Um, and I think, you know, media would probably be better off served just, you know, sticking, keeping calm and rational and sticking to the facts. Yeah, uh, I can't disagree with you, Andrew. Oh, oh look, one, one other question I want to ask you just randomly, yep. Andrew. And mainly because I drive a diesel vehicle, um, the mighty Range Rover. Um, a lot of reports about a shortage of diesel in the country and diesel prices going to, through the roof. Does that affect um, your sector disproportionately? And what are your members feeling in terms of diesel prices and diesel availability, even though you do not play the road user charge on it? Um, it's pretty bloody scary. I know... Uh, you know, there's a bloody large fuel tank on my tractor and it takes a lot of diesel and it does burn through it quite quickly. So, you know, I've seen uh, the contractors uh, this year, they've said, you know, prices are having to go up um, just because of the, you know, the diesel prices. So, you know, the costs are being felt through the agricultural sector. Um, and so many of the, so much of the stuff you do, you know, you're relying on a diesel vehicle to, to get it done and keep things uh, moving on farms. So, we do use quite a quite a lot of diesel, and you know that's having a big impact on um, farm costs, Gosh, which will yeah. undoubtedly which feed, flow through to yeah, feed through to the supermarket. Yeah, that's food for prices. Sure. Yep. Hey, Andrew, always good yarning, mate. I thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. Have a great day. No worries. Thanks, Sean. Cheers. That is Andrew Hoggard, the head of Federated Farmers, and his predecessor. I didn't realise this. Mind you, it sounds like every man and his dog has got a free airline ticket burns quite a lot of fossil fuel, that, uh, to cop in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. Apparently there are 20 or 30 Iwi leaders who have gone there. That's useful, isn't it? That's useful. And I honestly, I've, I've been to Sharm el-Sheikh. It is just a whole lot of, of deck chairs and golden sand and a really blue Mediterranean sea. It's hot as Hades. Um... But other than that, what is it? It's just a bunch of sand.